Latch the windows, lock the doors, and put the kids to bed. It's time for another episode of Tales from the Garage. Okay, so here I am again, totally unprepared. Uh, as of about 10 minutes ago, I didn't even know I was going to film a video, and I just decided to, uh, which means there's no preparation, which means I can do nothing but a vinyl pull. Um, I was thinking of uh, my previous video, I talked about how great this compilation is, uh, Rainbow Bridge on um, New Earth Records, and um, how it got me into uh, seeing this, this compilation on my shelf again, um, got me into pulling down uh, Sam Body Prem, a guitarist that recorded for the label, and has gone on to other labels since, and um, it caused me to pull a lot of my uh, New Earth recordings, including those by a uh, horn player, another guy, like Sambadi Prem, I'm pretty sure this guy's German, even though when you hear his music, all you hear is the East Indian influence. So there's this whole, as I mentioned in the previous uh, video, this whole group of musicians in Germany that somehow got very heavily influenced um, by Indian music. And like I mentioned before, uh, maybe one of the ways they got influenced so heavily by Indian music is because uh, most of the uh, initial musicians that were signed to this new Earth label uh, were followers of Osho, who is a, a mystic or whatever you want to call him, religious icon that uh, a lot of people fo uh, followed who came out of India. And um, I suspected that the new Earth record label uh, had some ties with Osho since everyone that recorded for the label in the early days uh, was a follower of hers and the, of his and um, I went on to to find that that yeah actually the label was uh, basically founded and created um, by a couple followers I believe of Osho and so they signed the musicians and there were many musicians who, who followed him and um, who went to his various places, uh, whether it was India or even the U.S., and uh, did music performances there, and it seems like a lot of those musicians ended up recording for this label. Um, makes sense, right? Um, and I thought, you know, I've, as I mentioned, I've been in this, this classical mode, um, you know, which is an acoustic music mode a lot, um, which I associate with the summertime and when the warm weather comes uh, annually, it's like a cycle that I get into. And I was going to talk about, you know, one of my mainstays, um, which is a wonderful album. Um, Nights in the Garden of Spain was the, the reason I bought this. This, this album has two long pieces in it. Uh, one is um, Nights in the Garden of Spain by Manuel de Falla and uh, another long term, uh, long epic piece, uh, Iberia by Isaac Albiens. Um, and I was going to talk about um, how I came across this music and then, and then I realized I did it. Uh, look at my Tales from the Garage, I think it's number 26 where I talk about classical music. And I went, and I was going to read, it's a good thing I checked, I was going to do this whole story all over again. Uh, you know, because it's something that, that hits on me every summertime, every year when the summer comes. Uh, and I think of this album, this, this, particular, this particular piece, it wasn't this album I heard, I don't know what version of it I heard back in the early 1980s. Um, very early 1980, like 80 or 81, on the overnight classical um, radio show that used to air on an NPR station out of New York City. Um, I don't know what version of, of the, the record I heard, and that was certainly a vinyl record at, at, at that time. And I picked this up uh, quite, a few, quite a few years later, in, in 87 or 88, um, on CD. So I didn't pick it up immediately upon hearing it. It took me six or seven or eight years. Uh, but I got I got this finally on CD. I, I I never picked it up on vinyl, even though it was the vinyl era when I first heard Nights in the Garden of Spain. Um, but um, I remembered the title for years, and it stuck with me. Uh, of listening to it at, at like three o'clock in the morning in a hot summer evening in in my in my bedroom in my old attic bedroom, um, staring out a window. 
And uh, the title stuck with me, so I never forgot it. So when I joined the Columbia House Classical Record Club, and a few years later when CDs had, had come along, I finally bought a version of Nights in the Garden of Spain. I was about to reiterate the whole story of it. And uh, I realized I did that in um, video number 26, Tales from the Garage, uh, which I ended up reviewing. I, 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 it was weird. I sat there and watched my own video the, just a, a few hours ago. Which makes me wonder, I wonder if any of you guys, uh, you know, you VC people that, that watch my videos, if you have a favorite video of your own that you made. Now right now, um, I like episode 26 because it, I, I told the story of uh, how I came to discover Knights in the Garden of Spain, the classical piece. And right now, that's probably my favorite of my past videos. Uh, but that's a fluid thing and that could change at any time. And I'm wondering if, if you folks out there who regularly make videos also for some reason have a favorite of your own for whatever reason, uh, for the, you know, because you showed uh, favorite albums of yours or because you, you had a story to tell or something like that. Um, so, but apart from that, I've got a few classical things here, you know, I don't think I'm gonna show them. Um, I think I'll save that for another time. Uh, a couple other classical lessons and maybe I'll do a larger longer video than I just pulled out like three other classical albums that I haven't shown but you know maybe I'll just I'm, I'm lazy and kind of low energy and uh, I thought I would just do a, a vinyl pull so I'm just gonna pull a couple albums and see what comes out uh, you know what I pulled this because the color of the cover uh, I couldn't imagine what it was. It looked brown to me because of the lighting in here, but it's purple. It's the original vinyl of Klaus Schultz's X album that I bought as a new release. When was it? 78? Um, all I know is this is the this is the original vinyl imported from Germany. Um, this is the first Klaus Schultz album I bought as a new release. I had gotten into Klaus Schultz a year or two prior to this, and all of the vinyls I had purchased up to that point were things that had been out for a little while. Uh, Time Wind, which had probably been out for maybe two years when I bought it, and Mirage, which had probably been out for maybe less than a year, but it wasn't a new release. And uh, here in this brain label. Um, but at the point that I got into Klaus Schultz, this is the first time that I ever saw a new release by him. Um, and so I, I picked it up. I, I didn't have the, the other prior nine albums of Klaus Schultz at this time yet. So I was kind of going back to the record store and at various points just deciding, okay, which one of Klaus's back catalog items am I going to buy? It just so happened that the record store that I was buying them uh, from had a uh, very large import section. And a guy that, um, a guy that was very much into uh, Klaus Schultz and he apparently knew a lot of things. And he kept uh, most of Klaus Schultz's um, back catalog, his first nine, 10 albums at that point. Uh, in stock and I was kind of just randomly selecting which ones to get and I, I don't know how many I had at this point I probably only had three or four uh, I'm sure I had Mirage I definitely had Time Wind maybe Airlift I'm not sure um, I know I didn't have Sideboard till later um, or, and Picture Music till later and Black Dance till later so this is probably my third or fourth and um, it was it was heavy, you know, because it was like, wow. The one thing you know about Klaus Schultz at this time period was that uh, for LPs, he made very long album sides, generally ranging from 25 to 30 minutes. So even a single LP was a, 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 a decent bargain because of the amount of music you would get, even if it was only one track per side, just in terms of, of time and length. They were always little, little adventures. You know, it was never the case of, like with every other album, you might get an album side that's 12 minutes long or something like that, 12 to 20 minutes long. Um, when you put on, back then, you know, when you drop the needle down on a Klaus Schultz uh, side of a vinyl, 
you knew you could sit down in place for a while, that this thing was going to go on, whether it was one track or more than one track, um, that it was going to be there for a while, so you could kind of sit back and get into it, and you wouldn't be getting up 12, 13, 14 minutes later. Um, but to, to see a double album set where the sides, um, well, I think that the shortest side on here is 28 minutes and 40 seconds. That's the short side. Um, and that is side three. And the longest side is, looks like it's side one at 29 minutes and 40 seconds. Even though side four is 29 minutes and 32 seconds. So this is almost two hours of stuff here, which is a lot for a two record set. And um, the lamination is coming off on my, see, it's a, on my vinyl here. You can see that's, but I mean, I guess it's age and it's weather or whatever. Um, you know, I don't listen to this anymore. I, 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 I've had two different, I think I have two different CD versions. From them. So I have a, yeah, I think I bought the second CD edition that came out. I've had this either on, on CD for some time. Um, what to say about Klaus Schultz? The pieces on here are very rhythmic in some cases uh, and have kind of aggressive drums and are fairly up-tempo at times. And those are the pieces I don't care so much for, to be honest. Um, I don't look for Klaus Schultz music to really be uh, up-tempo, even though at times it is, or heavily uh, influenced with drums, which sometimes it is. Um, but, and I think most of those pieces are on the first two sides. The third and, the third and fourth side are uh, each only have one piece, and uh, the third side is 28 minutes and 40 seconds. The fourth side is 29 minutes and 32 seconds, and they each both have only one piece on them. And to me, that's the real meat and potatoes of this album. Uh, and all the tracks are named after people that influenced him. Uh, in some cases, composer. I don't think these are all composers, though. I think some of them are, some of them are writers. Um, but the last piece was fairly well known. Uh, he's got an orchestra on there. Uh, and it was also used in a science fiction movie. I'll never forget this. These are the days before the internet when you knew nothing about Klaus Schultz because you couldn't read about him anywhere here in America. Uh, not even the, the, the music magazines that covered um, a lot of European esoteric artists even bothered to ever do uh, an article on him. And so there was very little information available. And I can remember one day, uh, uh, several years after, I want to say the early 80s, uh, after I bought this album, uh, and the fourth piece is the real killer piece on here because of the orchestra. Uh, the mixture of, of orchestra and synthesizer just really works well, even though I love the third side too. The fourth side is a piece called Henrik von Kleist. And um, I don't know who Henrik von Kleist is. I don't know if he's a writer or a musician. I'm not sure. Um, but it's, it's, it's a great piece. Actually, side three and four are both great. And side one and two are more the, the almost like the Tangerine Dreamish things with the heavy sequencer and the drums kicking in um, and the things that I'm not as fond of. But it's certainly worth it for the last two tracks, which are side three and four. But uh, back in the early 80s, I, I turned on the TV and I'm watching this sci-fi movie once. This obscure sci-fi movie that I'd never heard of called Barracuda. And Barracuda came out in the, I want to say, somewhere 79, 78, 80, somewhere, somewhere in there. It was an independent, um, very inexpensive, uh, and I thought I knew all sci-fi horror movies. I'd never heard of this. So it was one of these movies, even though it was filmed in America, it was an American backed film, um, filmed in America. I believe it was distributed here, but I don't know if it was one of those things that just played at drive-in movie theaters or just as like a B feature somewhere. Uh, never played in theaters around here, I'm fairly sure. And I had read, I guess, in the TV guide a description of it and, and um, nothing on TV, and I'm watching this movie Barracuda, and all of a sudden I hear, and I hear the fourth side of Klaus Schultz on there. Um, 
And it turned out, I don't know how the film the filmmakers must have known his music and been familiar with it, and I guess contacted him to ask if there was something that they could use of his in their in their movie. I'm fairly sure the fourth piece on this album was not written for the movie, but rather it was probably something that Klaus Schulz was working on or had just finished recording at the time the movie producers um, contacted him and asked him if he had anything for their movies. Because it, it kicks in a few times, and there's a, a very notable uh, main theme played on orchestral strings, real orchestral strings, um, that is very noticeable if you notice the piece. And all of a sudden I heard it in this movie. So I, uh, so I was I was amazed. Um, it was the first and only time I've actually heard Klaus's music used um, in, in film anywhere. And actually, the movie came out on DVD a, a few years ago. I don't know if it's on print, but I very quickly snapped up a copy because that, that one time that it was on TV was the only time I had ever saw Barracuda. And I was curious um, to what extent if there was any more music used uh, in the movie, but I didn't really spot any. They did use various sections from, from this one long track, uh, Henrik von Kleist, um, in the movie. But I think that's the only... Klaus Schultz music that was used in the movie. But I have it on DVD now, and it was interesting seeing now, after all those years, like I said, the early uh, 80s, since I saw Barracuda on TV. Um, this was certainly, you know, in, in, to me, after this, there's only, you know, if, if, if I was going to get somebody into Klaus Schultz's music, and I told them, do you want to hear the best of Klaus Schultz's music? I would stick with the first 10 albums, and this being the 10th. Um, and I can only really think of two or three albums after that. Of all the albums that he's made, and of all the albums of his that I own, that have come out since then, that were the equal of these first 10 albums. So, you know, it, it's, it's from here back that I would say, this is where you discover what the guy's all about. Um, and this was an album that, yeah, you know, I, I, the funny thing is I couldn't get, I couldn't find a blank cassette long enough to fit both uh, sides of an album on to have it play in my car. So I think I ended up making two cassettes. Um, I think this is one that I played in my car that I probably made a cassette of. But uh, I can, this is a whole, this is like an evening of entertainment because it's, it's, that's come out on CD since and there's even more material on the CD. But the additional material is kind of just a very poorly recorded live performance of the last track, um, which is probably the best track on the album. But it, to be honest, it doesn't really add anything to the to the album. But um, you know, this this there were times when I would listen to this, even though I'm, I'm I'm less fond of the first two sides, I still like them. And there 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 were days and evenings when I would just sit and put on these two albums, and it was two hours of music. Um, and it was like a whole, a whole night basically of entertainment, of, of getting into his own. Um, and uh, I have a lot of, you know, it's one of those albums that there's no reason why I have certain associated memories. Like for some reason I can remember shopping at a mall that I haven't been to in years. Um, whenever I think of this album. And I guess the only reason was is, is clo the, the day that I picked up this album or that same weekend, I must have gone to this particular mall that I'm thinking of because oddly enough, it's not the mall that I bought this album in. And yet, I always think of this one particular mall and shopping around there. Uh, so it's, it's weird because there's no real association to that mall with this album because I bought this album at a different mall. And yet, I, that weekend, I must have been shopping at that other mall for some reason. And I, I think I was thinking, oh, when I go home, I'm going to listen to the Klaus Schultz X album again. And simply from, I guess, having that thought, I, um, I now have the permanent association all these years later. This was like 78 or 79. And I still think about that mall every time I go. Every time I go and I look at this album or I play it or anything. All right, this is going on long and I still only have picked one album. Uh, I, gotta, I see something blue. Oh, I spoke about him. Um, I've spoken about him before. Anthony Phillips, who I did a video on. This is probably the second album I ever picked up by him. It was a cutout 
399 of his first Private Parts and Pieces album, Anthony Phillips was the original guitarist for Genesis, but not when they were a pop band and not even when they were even well known. He only played on their first two albums, uh, From Genesis to Revelation and Trespass in 1970. So he left the band in 1970, which a lot of people don't even realize Genesis went back that far. Um, and at the time that I started picking up his solo albums, uh, I had been a big Genesis fan, their 70s music only, um, for years, and they had started to transition from 1978 on into a pop band, and by 1981 they were a full-blown pop band. Um, and I was kind of disappointed with the direction that their music went in. And even though I had jumped into the ECM world and stuff, I still wanted to hear some good new prog music, and I wasn't finding it because no one was making it at that at that time. In 79, it was gone. Uh, 80, it was gone. Um, and so I started looking into the catalogs of uh, you know various uh, solo albums by artists that had played in these bands that used to be prog bands but probably weren't anymore. So I started buying things like uh, Tony Banks and uh, Steve Hackett and, and things like that. Um, and one of the albums I bought um, of Anthony Phillips was, Jesus, is it The Geese and the Ghost? It was one of his early ones. Um, and I think that was the first one, and I think I got that on sale also. And because, you know, again, this is in the days before the internet. Uh, and this was probably 78. Um, oddly, some close, close to the, the time period that I picked Klaus Schulze. Um so I, I probably was buying Anthony Phillips things, knowing his history, um, and was curious what his solo stuff sounded like. And I remember seeing his albums in the import sections where I would see and look for my Klaus Scholz stuff. And because that at that time, his records often were put, um, for some reason, in the import section, even though they were being released in America here on a label that doesn't exist anymore, Passport Records, which was, I don't know if Passport Records was out of New Jersey, I think they were, but I know the Gem Records, who I believe distributed them, was out of New Jersey. And um, when was this? this? So this came out in 78, 1978, on Passport Records. Now, The Geese and the Ghost is a very nice album. It's got a few vocal pieces on it. Uh, and like most of Anthony Phillips' music, is mainly acoustic-oriented. Acoustic guitars, piano, various stringed instruments, uh, acoustic classical, nylon gu guitars, charango, like mandolins. And he has uh, uh, guests who play, uh, you know, a lot of things like flutes and um, hand percussion and things like that, generally speaking. That's how Anthony Phillips' early albums rolled. And I, oddly enough, I can remember seeing this when, when Private Parts and Pieces came out um, here in the US. Apparently in the UK, it came out, I don't know if it was, it, it was in a two pack. I think it was with The Geese and the Ghost, but I'm not sure. Whatever Anthony Phillips' first official solo album was that came out in the late 70s. Um, Private Parts and Pieces number one, this is a series now that numbers many volumes, um, was initially uh, a twofer, and I'm talking about vinyl, the vinyl age, came out as a second disc. And in this twofer, when it came out in the, when they distributed it in the US, both albums came out separately. Uh, I don't know if it's just a money thing, where they thought they could get more money by releasing the two albums separately, or if it was too expensive, they thought for uh, kind of blind buyers to, to pick up uh, a two record set, which is obviously going to be more expensive than a single album set, especially by somebody who's fairly unknown because the first two Genesis records were not popular. Um, so Anthony Phillips was not a known name. However, for some reason, and I don't know why, I can remember uh, 
seeing in the record shops where i used to shop in this in this one mall they would have in each section you know jazz rock whatever new releases kind of like featured albums and they would be displayed a bit more prominently than other records it was kind of a random choice and for some reason at some point they chose anthony phillips private parts and pieces one only at this one record store and they had a bunch of copies of it and i remember seeing the title of it i had no idea who anthony phillips was i probably found out about a year or two later i'm not sure um i would have been into genesis already at that point but i don't know if i knew their history but i remember seeing the title and seeing the album cover which i always kind of thought was neat um his early albums all had art by is it peter cross is the guy's name uh yes peter cross i guess peter cross his name is on here he did a bunch of the early the early album cover art for anthony phillips uh, and and wonderful art that's slightly uh i like it better than the early genesis uh albums like nursery crime and foxtrot but it's a slightly similar style to that um but i actually like his his art better he did probably most of the early anthony phillips album covers now for some reason this totally uncommercial album was on display in the new releases section of i don't know if it was in rock section or where they put it uh like i said they used to stick him in the import section it might have even been in the import section i remember seeing it and seeing the title and thinking that's an interesting title uh that's an interesting album cover and what this is is actually you know this is one of this is one of anthony's definitive albums and in fact one that i would steer people to if you didn't know his music it's it's a good he's got he's got dozens and dozens of albums out now and he's got compilations maybe a compilation would be better but um this is certainly one of the albums i would steer people toward to get a taste for kind of what his music is all about he's gone in tangents he's even made some vocal oriented pop albums uh he's done a couple electronic oriented albums but most of what he does is acoustic oriented music if not all out completely acoustic music this is also a few years before new age and before windham hill came along and all those and he was a real early forerunner of that kind of uh, pastoral it's not classical music but it sounds kind of like it um it's like a a, a folky classical music um with wonderful instrumentation and these the, the first the first few in the series were basically uh just comprised a whole bunch of usually short pieces uh that anthony recorded in his home at various times and were not specifically made uh for with an album in mind and when he made the first volume of this private parts and pieces he just gathered together um various things that he had finished little pieces he had finished and recorded but had not uh you know commercially put out anywhere so a lot of short pieces on here and a lot of pieces from uh the early 70s um 1972 76 a whole bunch of pieces are from 76 um some were composed in 70 and 72 and recorded in 76 some were actually written and recorded in 72 um pretty much all originals uh with mike rutherford from genesis co-writing one track actually which probably was a like a leftover genesis thing i'm thinking uh, from the early days when anthony was in the band like i said mostly uh well it, it's listed here as a collection of guitar and piano solos duets and ensembles gives you an idea what it's about uh actually you know when it comes to kind of like that acoustic windham hill thing i actually prefer anthony phillips over any of the windham hill artists to be honest with you um he's got a little bit more variety he was initially the lead guitarist in genesis but he's really a good piano player too he's really a good keyboard player and so he's done albums uh, solo albums that are just keyboards uh like the title says this one is is guitar pieces 
I don't think there's any electric guitar on here. There may be a little bit, um, but it's mostly acoustic and, and uh, nylon string guitar, pianos, that kind of thing. And just a, a bunch of really kind of pretty short pieces, pretty much all originals, like I said. And um, I'm looking for additional musicians, and I, and I don't see any. Most of his albums, uh, even the ones in the Private Parts and Pieces series, which he's on to 13 or 14 or 16 now, I'm not sure, um, do have guests on them. And they're guests that play things like flutes, whistles, uh, some maybe maybe some horns, some saxophone, or something something like that. Um, but this one actually looks to be, um, and I didn't even realize this. I thought there were guests on here, but I'm not seeing any listed. Uh, but but it's 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 a beautiful album, and there's uh, notes listed on each track as to information about the origin of the track and their inspiration to give you an idea a little bit of what the music sounds like. One piece was uh, inspired by hearing a Chopin nocturne. And another piece he mentions Debussy. So it kind of gives you an idea of, of where he's coming from. And the one thing about his music that I've always thought since the very first album I bought, this by him, and this is the, probably the second one, and it certainly um, certainly backed up that feeling, is I've never heard music that sounds more like the British countryside. Now, I've never been to the British countryside, though I've probably seen more British TV than people living in England, because I tend to watch more British things than I watch American things, and even old series and things like that going back to the 1970s or even back further. Um, so I kind of like know a lot of the British slang terms and things like that just from watching these shows. And uh, one thing, and there's a whole series of mystery movies that were basically made out in the uh, in the 70s uh, that took place a lot of them out in the British countryside. And wow, what a what a view that is! And uh, once you see some of those sites of the British countryside, and if you're watching a, a movie or a film that has them in there and you hear the music that kind of sticks with you and even though Anthony Phillips has written music uh, for various um, documentaries and video productions and television etc etc I don't know if his music was ever specifically used for various uh, like a series or a TV movie made in for England or in England uh, but it should have been because to me, his music is, uh, you just put it on, and that's what, that's what British countryside sounds like. If you ever had a visual of a British countryside, this would be the sound that goes with it, uh, which is the, kind of that pastoral, acoustic thing. And now that I've just randomly pulled that album, I have not listened to Anthony Phillips since, uh, since a, a while ago now, since the time I did a video on him. Um, but his early acoustic music very much fits this whole summertime acoustic vibe that I'm in. And uh, and it's weird how I get in, so influenced by my random vinyl pulls here. Um, how after I make the video, that's the music I end up listening to. I had pulled out a Keith Jarrett album going back a ways called Book of Ways, which is one of the few albums that I had of Keith Jarrett's on vinyl that I hadn't picked up on, on compact disc. And after doing a random vinyl pull, of Book of Ways, which was a two disc set, I just had to have the CD, I had to go find it and buy it, it was out of print and I went nuts looking for it, and eventually I found a, a copy of it on CD and was able to listen to it again. But it's weird how these random vinyl pulls, I'm just giving you my impressions and talking about these albums, and yet it almost always influences what I end up listening to for the next several days after the video is, is done and made. So I'm only going to pull two for this time because of my long windedness. So that's what I'm doing on this Sunday evening. Um, once again, late here in the in the garage. And I um, hope everybody's doing well. I'll be back with a random vinyl pull again very soon. Or, if I'm not so damn lazy, maybe I'll do a prepared video. But don't count on it. All right, guys. I'll be back. See you soon. Take care.
Tune in next time for more Tales from the Garage.